great. Welcome, everyone. Today's presentation is part of the Culture Builds Communities webinar series. This community-based project is designed to help Native communities plan and develop cultural facilities. Culture Builds Communities is a project of the Association of Tribal Archives, Libraries, and Museums. Major funding is provided by the Institute of Museum and Library Services and the National Museum of the American Indian. Thank you so much for being here today, Rachel. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Um, okay, so today we're going to talk, let's see, let's start the next slide, Melissa. Perfect. Um, this webinar is titled Navigating the General Facilities Report, and as I told folks at NMAI, it's going to be a rocking good time, so get ready. Um, the General Facilities Report uh, is a very big document, and it is in that way kind of a big, scary document. I remember the first time I had to sort of interpret one and try to fill one out. I was like, this, this is a lot. Do I really have to do all of this? So what I thought would be most helpful would be to just sort of take us through it slowly and see where we end up. So next slide, please. We're gonna start at the beginning. What is the General Facilities Report? So the General Facilities Report is a document that is put out by the American Alliance for Museums. Um, it, the first version was from 1988 as the standard facilities report. And then it's been revised, I think three times, 2008, no, 98, 2008. And then they just redid it in, 2000, in 2019 last year. Um, it was supposed to get a big rollout at the AAM meeting. Um, and then instead, I think they did a couple of webinars sort of like this. So um, there's a new version. That's the one we're going to use. It's not altogether very different from the last version. I will tell you that. So the general facility report is used by lenders as a tool, um, mostly to evaluate a potential loan site. So it's, very, it's a very thorough document. It really does provide all the information that a lender would want to know, assuming that a borrower updates it on a regular basis. Um, AAM doesn't police its use, but many museums have adopted it as a must have item before a loan request will be considered. So, and for that reason, NMAI, for example, you know, when you request a loan from NMAI, we're going to ask you for your general facilities report. So for that reason alone, <laughs> it's, um, it's worth it for a borrower to really put some time and effort into its completion. Now, every lender has a different relationship with the document and people at different institutions emphasize different aspects of it. So depending on what the questions are being, um, a lot of times it has to do with what objects you're asking to borrow. Um, so depending on that, or depending if you have a question, something doesn't seem quite right, um, it's usually best to clarify with a lender while you're filling it out um, to make sure that you've got all the information that they are going to want. Now, the other thing to remember about this document is that it is highly confidential. This document is going to contain everything in your facility about the security and where the doors are and where the alarm system is and who has keys to what and what is what are your security controls so you really want to make sure to be um, very judicious about your use of the document and how you give it to people um, just keep that in mind um, so next slide please Just a couple of tips before we start going through it. Um, the GFR is very dense. It's dense because it's trying to provide a lot of information in one place at one time, which isn't necessarily an easy thing to do. Um, so you wanna be able to take it one step at a time or one section, take it a page at a time, say today I'm going to work on page three and just do page three and it'll make you feel a little bit better because it's not really all that hard. It's just so big that you get to the start of it and you say, oh, this is going to be too much to do. Um, at least if you're anything like me, <laughs> I'm like, oh, this document is so scary. So um, the other thing, 
so, so don't let it overwhelm you. But the other thing to remember is that you're not going to know all of the information. Most people in museums, you know, mu most museums are big enough that they are stratified enough that there's a lot of different people that have a lot of different knowledge and you're not necessarily the person that's going to know the whole thing. So consider who at your institution does know something. You know, maybe you need to ask your facilities management staff, if you have a facilities management staff, about the fire protection system. Maybe you need to reach out to your um, security department to talk about the situation with your guards or your alarm system. Um, you can think of it as relationship building sort of in the same way as we talk about, um, you know, these are folks from your institution, but they're also stakeholders in your institution, these colleagues of yours. So you can ask and lean on them for their knowledge and contribute that to the report. And then you can all sort of feel like you're in it together. Um, next slide, please. So these are the different sections of the GFR. Um, there are many, but they're not as scary as they might be. So um, you've got a section on general information, one on building construction, configuration, maintenance, and the new version has tucked handling and packing into this section. It used to be its own section. And we can talk about why that's here now um, when we get there. Um, there's a section on your environment, uh, both your temperature and humidity systems, your lighting systems, um, there's a section on fire protection, there's a section on security, a section on insurance, um, and then questions about who else have you borrowed from. And then the supplementary question section is for folks who have special circumstances. Do you live in an earthquake prone zone? Do you live in a floodplain? Um, these are the questions that you only have to answer if you can answer yes to those specific questions. Um, and again, you're not going to know all of these answers. You're not going to know how to answer all of these questions. Um, if you're a small institution, you can probably get a small group of staff together and sort of hammer it all out. If you're part of a larger institution like a university, um, you can reach out to different people at the university. So my experience, for example, before I came to NMAI, I was, uh, a longtime registrar at the Textile Museum, which is a tiny little museum in Washington, DC. And partway through the time that I was there, we embarked on a partnership with George Washington University to build a new museum building uh, on their campus. And all of a sudden, the facilities report was very different. And I also had to find new connections in order to answer some of those questions. You know. I don't know how the police situation works at the university level. So I had to reach out to the chief of police for the university and say, hey, can you talk to me a little bit about how you plan to protect the museum? How are you working this into your, um, your overall university protection plan? Um, I was instrumental on the team that built the building. So I had access to some of the contract staff who had worked on the environmental systems and the HVAC system. So I knew to go to them with those questions because otherwise, I don't know, what are we doing about this building? How, um, how is it going to be temperature controlled? What are we doing about the humidity? Um, I knew all of the discussions that had gone on about fire protection, but for people that aren't involved in the um, design of the building, you could very easily go to your local fire station and say, hey, you know, you're how many miles away from us? What's your general response time? You know, you're going to be able to find those people that are going to help you through those questions. Again, it's think of it as relationship building. You want to get to know your local fire station. They want to know you. It's win-win. Um, so let's see. Let's start from the beginning. Next slide, please. So what I did um, when I first was starting to work on this presentation is I started screenshotting some of the pieces from the facility report. So this is a screenshot of the page that is the borrowing institution profile. So this is going to be very basic information about your institution and why you want the loan of any objects at all. Um, 
it's going to provide as much contact information as the lender might need. You know, they want to know a lot. They're going to want to know a lot, but they also want to know who is the main person to contact at your facility. Is it you? Who are you? What's your role? Are you the registrar? Are you the director? How can they make sure that they have the right person that they can direct questions to? Um, and then after this, um, once they know who you are, the facility report goes into a series of questions about your museum structure. Are you a standalone museum? Are you part of a larger organization? Again, this is going to help the lender to understand whether you are part of a big institution. Are, you, are there going to be other stakeholders that they might have to work around? Or are they just going to be dealing with you and a very small number of staff? Um, and to that end, next slide, please. This is the chart that the report provides to gain more information about the broader scope of who's on staff at your institution. Um, this is more, you know, it's not going to be all of the staff at your institution. A, a lender for objects doesn't necessarily care who your gift shop manager is unless your gift shop manager has a very specific stake in loans. Um, so this is more about who uh, works with the exhibitions team, who's going to be handling those loans and responsible for those loans from their institution. Um, this list, because it comes from this very technical document, is very specific to museum type jobs. So it's going to ask you for your registrar or collections manager. Is there a secondary registrar or collections manager? Is there an exhibitions manager, an art handler? You can see the list of um, of roles and titles. There are a lot of institutions that don't have all of these roles filled, certainly. And certainly there are other small organizations where many one person wears many hats, or you have a curator who's also taking on registration functions, a lot of collections management duties. Um, so I think the best advice I can give you is to fill it out as best you can in terms of who they're going to want to know to contact for certain things. If you don't have, um, you know, all of these different, if you don't have a conservator on staff, don't fill in, don't fake it. Just, you don't have a conservator on staff. That's not gonna be a make or break part of any kind of lending program. Um, it's, it's also kind of helpful for you. You know, again, in small institutions, generally you know who to call, you know who your staff has, but if you are a part of a larger organization, for example, again, I'm gonna hark back to the Textile Museum a lot because I was there for a very long time and they're very small. So it's an interesting uh, juxtaposition, but when we moved to George Washington University and then, for example, when I then moved on to NMAI, there are a lot more layers. I still don't know who to call sometimes at NMAI. I'm like, wait, which department is that? Because there are so many. Um, so staff might be people that you don't know or haven't met. So when I first came to NMAI, I looked at our facility report and I said, oh, well, here's these names. I haven't met this person. Let me go and introduce myself. This had a lot to do with, you know, NMAI also has three facilities. So one of our main exhibition spaces is up in New York and my office is down in Maryland. So going up to New York, just to meet some of those staff members, some of those facilities staff, the security up there, because always it's a question of just trying to get to know people. And that's within my own institution. So the more that you can look at this list and know who is important to involve and who is important to call is going to be helpful to you. And I always, I always used to use the, in case you get hit by a bus tomorrow, um, explanation for things. And then I realized that's not really fun. So in case you decide to retire and move to Fiji, other people should know where to find the contact information for who they should call um, in an emergency in particular. So that's one of the double benefits of providing this kind of list and having it in an accessible location. So after I had put in this um, slide, I went, this is going to be long and sort of tedious. And what might be better is if I go through the document with you, I'm gonna scroll through it, we'll stop, 
we'll look at things and you know I want to provide time for questions as well so there will definitely be time at the end but I also think if you want to stop me I don't think there are very many people in this that we couldn't just you know turn on your your microphone and interrupt me so um, Melissa, I'm going to ask you to pause the PowerPoint here and I'm going to share my screen. Let's see. There we go. All right. Can everybody see that? Excellent. Um, so once you've filled in your general information, now we're gonna move into the meat of the facility report. And all of the questions are important, but some of them are probably more important than others. And if you don't know the answer, you need to figure out how to go and find the answer. And that's okay because there's gotta be somebody around that knows something. And if you don't know the answer and you don't find anybody that does know the answer. Some of these questions are going to be such that you can say, we don't know. And that's also going to be okay. Another thing that I want to point out about the general facility report is that this isn't a document that a lender is going to read and say, oh no, we can't lend to them because. We want this kind of information, speaking from a lender's point of view, even if it's not perfect and no museum is perfect but particularly when we get into the um, environmental sections you know people sort of want to fudge their environmental readings because they're afraid that if they don't have perfect environmental controls you know big museums aren't going to let their objects come and and be lent to you and that's not the case at all Particularly for us, it's really important when we get a loan request to be able to go through the facility report and look at it. Not because it's gonna decide what we can and can't lend, but more it's going to decide how we can lend something. So for example, um, maybe I'll save that for the environment. Sorry, I'm gonna save that for the environmental section. But just to make myself clear here, you know, you want to be as honest as possible because we're not looking for a way to trip you up. We're more looking for the information that we as a lender want to know about where our objects are going to be. So we're going to start with your building because that's the outside of where the objects will be. Um, when was your building constructed? What building museum materials were used? Um, so there's a lot of questions about construction. If you already know who built your building or when it was built, who to talk to about that, get in touch with them. There are going to be lots and lots of people that are going to be able to help you out with that kind of information. And then there's questions like, is there carpeting in the space where the loan will be? And that has a lot to do with pest, um, any kind, it, you know, what are the risks involved? Are there potential pests? Carpet sort of attacks pests or, or attracts pests. But again, you know, I've worked in many museums where the gallery spaces were carpeted and the carpet wasn't the biggest issue, so it's not a problem. Um, we're going to look at doors. How do you get between the floors of the museum? Are there stairs? Is there an elevator? Going back to the textile museum, we had an elevator technically, it was from 1906 and it had a little gate on it. And it was, I called it the Alice in Wonderland elevator because it was literally about six inches higher than me and I'm not very tall. Um, so it wasn't really a useful tool for moving objects safely per se, but we had an elevator. Um, 207 here is kind of an important one. Will there be any anticipated or active construction renovation during the loan period. And again, this comes from a risk management perspective. Construction is a very risky time. So a lender is going to want to know if their objects are going to be um, subjected to an institution where there are potential contractors, where there are heat guns being used, where there are materials that are more combustible, um, 
during a time when their objects are on display. So um, in the interest of making sure that their objects are safe, that's an important question to know the answer to. Um, let's see, programming, ah, eating and drinking. You also may not have all these many areas in your museum, but you know, fill in the ones that you know. Do you, involve, do you allow food and drink in your galleries? That's another risk management from a pest management perspective. Um, and here we get into the depth, deeper pest management questions and what programs your facility uses to mitigate pest management. Again, certain objects from, a, you know, have a much higher risk level for pests than others. Pots, ceramic pots, for example, not very many pests will get into those, but textiles, paper, um, wood, those kinds of things definitely have some effect, have seen effects from pest infestation that can severely be, you know, detrimental. So again, it's a question of knowing what the possibilities are and what the options are when you're lending to someone. Um, and then from there, we move into the specific spaces. Um, what's the layout of your exhibition space? Is it a big room, small rooms? They're going to look for dimensions. What's the weight load capacity of exhibition gallery floors? Now it says if it pertains to the object loan objects in question. Not everybody fills this one out because it's very rare that you're requesting an object that might test the floor load of a gallery. Um, again, back at the textile museum, we did have some floor load issues. Our library was above our double bay high ceiling gallery. And um, that was a little bit nerve wracking since books are quite heavy to be on the third floor above a, you know, non-supported space. But, you know, we didn't need to answer this question for an exhibition gallery space because it didn't really matter. Those were, the, first of all, they were on the ground floor. And second of all, we were requesting textiles for the most part. So very few of them are heavy enough to um, call a gallery load capacity into question. Two sixteen is also something that people want to be aware of: water fixtures, plumbing, sinks, water fountains, in or above the areas where the loans are displayed. You know, fire protection um, pipes aside, you don't really want water leaking near your exhibition spaces, and particularly lenders are going to be a little bit sensitive about where their objects are displayed if there are a lot of um, water features around. Them. And here we're going to look at questions 218 about modular walls. Um, again, that has to do with the stability of the manner in which you're going to be installing the pieces. If you're looking at floor cases, um, you're still going to, you know, they still might want to know this because they're going to want to know how those walls are installed. How are they supported? Is there any risk of them falling over? Um, and a lot of modular walls, you want to look at, you know, flame resistant paint, that sort of thing. Like, do they have that kind of a capacity? Are you really protecting the items in your gallery? Um, shipping and receiving. Getting into these details, this has everything to do with how the loans are getting to you and from where. Um, NMAI has a big loading dock underground. NMAI New York, however, has a loading dock, except that you can't really back a truck into it that is longer than 24 feet because the side street is too small and the angle won't work. So you have to know certain things like that about your own buildings. Um, the textile museum, bless it, originally was in two historic mansions in um, DuPont Circle part of DC, if anybody's familiar with that. So they were beautiful houses, not at all well suited to be a museum. And the pathway to get into them 
was so narrow that you had to be able to walk through one building into another building, or you had to go through the alleyway between the buildings, up a narrow ramp, around a corner, and go in through the fake wall that was in front of the double portico doors in the back end of the gallery. Um, there were times at the textile museum that we had to offload trucks on the street, which is very, very unsafe. Um, but, you know, because people who were shipping to us didn't pay attention to the facility report when it said, no, we can't accommodate your crate that is this big by this big. And that's how they sent the objects. So sometimes it doesn't always work, but you'd think if you put this in your facilities report, it will narrow down the chances of the crate being too big for your space, because that's not what people want. You know, tell us how big your door is. We're going to tell our shippers and say, oh, but their door is only this big, so you can only make the crate Y big. Um, so again, this is a super helpful document to know exactly how big we can make crates and exactly when we can send things. You know, our shippers are going to say, oh, well, we're going to we're going to do it in an exclusive truck, but then they're going to get there at 7 p.m. And we're going to be able to say, but they're not available to receive shipments at 7 p.m. So we're going to have you do it a different way. So it's a question of not necessarily limiting anything by answering these questions, but more making it clear what can be done when we are shipping things. And if you can accommodate that 7 p.m. shipment, great you can say yes. Um, we've already talked about the maximum size vehicle the loading area will accommodate. Restrictions to the loading dock, such as tight turns. That's a fun one. NMAI New York, super fun. Um, and so here are the different, um, you can give the dimensions, you can give a weight capacity. You know, again, there's an elevator also at NMAI New York, but the elevator doors are not as big as the gallery doors. So a crate could fit into the gallery, but it won't be able to get there because the elevator doors wouldn't be big enough. So it would have to be smaller than the elevator doors in order to accommodate that crate. But not at all surprising. When you have a museum that's in a historic building, you have a lot of these challenges. Um, so this 2.25, what's the maximum crate size you can accommodate, you want to make sure that it's really the smallest door you have. At NMAI New York, it is the elevator door. So you want to make sure that those crates will fit through the very smallest opening. Otherwise, you end up opening crates in very random spaces. Um, and then we move, continue to move through shipping. Who, what staff are available for loading crates, for unloading crates. Again, do you have a freight elevator? A freight elevator is very different from regular elevator. And again, even at NMAI New York, the freight elevator doors are not big enough for the gallery doors, if I'm remembering that correctly. Um, and if you don't have these, a, a loading dock or some kind of space like that, how do you receive shipments? Well, we move the crate off of the truck. We have to, you know, use a dolly to get it over the curb and into the building. You're going to want to tell people that because then you're going to want to make sure that when they're packing their crates, they're not terribly heavy because people are going to have to manhandle them. Um, can you transport your own equipment? This question, does the institution have a van or truck appropriate for transporting objects? Most lenders are not going to ask you to transport their objects for them, um, but you never know. So if you have a vehicle that you use to transport objects, you know, maybe at some point something can be worked out. So always answer all the questions, even if you're like, nobody's gonna let us do that. You never know. Um, and for a lot of uh, museums use a lot of different shipping companies. So if you have a particular relationship with someone in your area, then you know, listing them here 
the lender can say, oh, well, you know, we're going to get it to Kansas City. And then from Kansas City, somebody else can take it. That's great. Um, so you never know. Um, and then, as I said before, in the in the previous iteration of the GFR, the handling and packing was its own section, but it does really fit here. Once you talk about shipping, we're also going to talk about handling the objects and unpacking them and repacking them. So it makes sense to put this here because this is information that you're going to want to know sort of right off the getting on from the, the shipping considerations and those crating questions about how big your crates can be. How are they going to be packed? Where are they going to be unpacked? Are they going to move from place to place? Can you unpack the crates right in your gallery? Who's going to unpack them? Is staff specially trained to pack and unpack loan objects? Um, do you have interns that are going to be working on it? You might want to list that or say, we have interns, but we don't allow them to handle objects. They're going to ask that question. Um, do staff use gloves for handling objects? So the questions seem sort of very specific, but again, as long as you answer some, you answer them, you can always explain yourself because again, you get the if not explain part of the question, which is always helpful. If you have a particular reason that you don't use gloves, we're gonna wanna know about it and that's fine. It's, you know, that will be taken under consideration when a loan is being considered. And if, if it's important enough to the lender, then they can stipulate on the other end, we recognize that you don't use gloves for these objects, but we are going to stipulate that in order to borrow these, you're going to have to use gloves. And then it's a negotiation, it's a discussion. Um, but if you don't use gloves and we don't know that you don't use gloves, then we can't say, well, these were treated with pesticides in the, you know, way back times, and you probably don't want to touch them with your hands. So there are sometimes really good reasons um, to want to know that bit of information that you might think, that's kind of a random bit of information, and do they really need to know that? Sometimes you do. Um, this one is a favorite of mine. How are loan objects moved between exhibition floors? Again, that's where your tiny elevator comes into play. If you have an elevator and people see, oh, I have an elevator, they'll think, oh, you put it on a cart, you roll it into the cart and you move it upstairs and it's all very safe. When really you're, you know, handling it up a flight of stairs and you have to pivot over the railing to make sure that it gets in because you're in a very old building and uh, it doesn't fit in the elevator. Again, these aren't necessarily going to be things that will make a lender say, that is a non-issue, we will not lend. But as long as they know, then they can work with you to see what their options are. Maybe there's another object that might be better suited that's not quite as big. Or maybe they'll say, specify, well, but this object needs to be treated in this way. And then you can have that discussion again. Um, and then uh, storage. Do you have space where those objects will be stored before they are installed or if they have to come off exhibition for any reason? Um, is that a secure space? Who controls that security? Um, what are the dimensions of the doors? Do you also have your collections there? These are all things that are of interest, but also pertinent to the lender's comfort level with sending objects your way. Um, do you have a highly secured in-house storage area for valuable small objects? Um, you know, NMAI has a vault, but prior to that, I'd never worked at a museum that had a vault. And we would explain that we don't have a small area um, here's the key structure, here's the alarms, who was in charge of what, and if it's a particular risk for the lender, then we could probably work something else out. We'll find a way. But if we don't know, then you can't find a way, and then it becomes a problem. So another part of this document is to establish that communication with the lender, because it's a partnership. 
you want to make sure that you're as open and upfront as you can be so that when the lender has questions or something happens, you've been open and upfront and you can start that dialogue and they can say, well, I didn't know that. And you can say, well, yes, it was in our facilities report. Boy, it was in your facilities report. We should have been more thoughtful on that. Um, so now we're heading into environment. And as I was uh, starting to say earlier in the presentation, the environment can be a tricky piece of anybody's facility. Um, you want to absolutely tell the truth about your environment because if you don't think that it matters and you think, oh, well, but they're not going to lend to us if our temperature isn't 70 degrees plus or minus or our relative humidity isn't 50% plus or minus, but it's not, then what we want to know as a lender is, okay, your facility has good temperature control. We're going to look at that graph. We're going to say, oh yes, it's fairly stable temperature, but your humidity is kind of all over the place. Well, then we can ask the question, what can we do to mitigate the effects on the objects that we're lending when we're lending them? We can think about climate controlled cases. We can consider, well, maybe we should have a conversation about is there a type of object that's a little bit less affected by wide swings in humidity. So again, it's an open, it's, it's trying to keep that open communication so that everybody gets what they want in the end, that the objects are happy and the people at both sides feel like they've been, cre they've created this environment where the objects can be happy and they're also safe and well cared for. So these questions may seem dense again, but they are really important. And part of why it's because we want to be able to know going in how we can best lend. Um, you know, the facilities report shouldn't be treated as a shut you down kind of a document, but it does need to be as it, it does, it can be a really effective tool to best figure out how to lend rather than just not to lend. Um, so we want to know about your equipment. Is it 24 hours, 24 seven? Is there a backup system? Um, and then where are these types of systems used? What types of systems are used? You have a, an overarching central system that takes care of everything. Do you have an air conditioner in your window? Do you have a dehumidifier in the corner? It might seem really random, but we want to know about it because we can then best figure out how to work around it. So this is where you're going to want to talk to building engineers if you have them who put in these systems what do the systems say if you have a building management system some larger institutions do that you can go to that's going to be um, a good resource um, because you know what kind of um, tools are you using to measure these kinds of um, you know the temperature the relative humidity if it's a building management system, it's going to have really point on point information. If it's a hydrothermograph, we're just going to want to know what that hydrothermograph says. And we're going to want to know that it's being monitored. So who monitors and services those units? Um, is it somebody on your staff? Is it a contractor? Is it somebody with a university that you're a part of? You know, who does that? Um, and what are their expertise so that we can best guess how effective their maintenance is kind of thing. You know, the textile museum, to go back to that, um, old historic houses 19, built in 1912 and 1914 respectively. Um, one of the buildings had been retrofitted in the late part of the 70s and had climate control but it wasn't really, it was temperature controlled, but not really humidity controlled. 
Um, and so our readings were all over the place. And um, we did a lot of contemporary, while I was there, we did a lot of contemporary, we got a lot of contemporary pieces on loan and loans from private lenders, but it was a lot harder to borrow from bigger institutions because some of them really were a lot more particular. And they said, sure, we'll lend to you, but we're gonna want a climate controlled case for that particular piece. And then it would become a question of cost. So sometimes we would be willing to do that because the piece was crucial to the exhibition and we wanted to make sure that it was included and we could put it in the budget. And sometimes it was a question of, we can't afford that. So we're gonna have to work something else out. Um, and one of the reasons that we ended up going to GW was that the, the very unstable um, relative humidity in those galleries. But it was an interesting experience to try and figure out how could we make it a little bit better? How could we put, could we put a dehumidifier in the gallery? What would help, you know, how would that help the situation. But it wouldn't have helped us if we had just said, oh yes, the relative humidity is 50% plus or minus two. And then people would come and wonder why the textiles were sort of curling up in weird places. Um, so you do want to make sure that you can provide the documentation um, that the lender wants. Um, and so this is the best way to sort of do that. And a lot of facilities reports, um, one of the instructions that comes with the facility report is they want you to actually put the charts from whatever is reading your temperature and humidity with the facility report. Um, say you're requesting a loan for just the spring, it's like a six month loan encompassing, um, you know, March through, August or what have you, um, they may ask for the temperature and humidity readings just for your spring and summer months, because that will give them a sense of what your galleries really do during that more, um, during that particular period of time. And that can sometimes be different than readings in the winter, for example. Buildings hold humidity in very different ways in different seasons. Um, so, you know, it's what, what are the conditions? How are you measuring the conditions? So they, they ask it, the, the GFR asks very specific questions about these kinds of, of things. Um, and then also in this section is about your lighting. And see here, this, this chart right here, the temperature and humidity, and it does break it down summer and winter, fall, spring and summer rather, fall and winter, because those are sometimes more grouped together. Um, and then we go into lighting. What kind of lighting do you have? Are there windows in your galleries? There are textiles on your loan list. We're going to try and figure out how to cover those up. Um, how do you measure the amount of light that's in your galleries? Do you have a light meter? Can you adjust the light levels? Would you ever internally light a case? Some of those big cases need to be internally lit. So what do you use in those to mitigate heat? Um, and then we move into fire protection. And this is where it's really can be helpful to talk to your local fire department, um, particularly since, you know, it is the fire department's job to respond to fire alarms. And if there is a fire, you really do want them to come and you want them to put water on the fire and put it out. But you can have conversations with them in advance of that to really sort of direct them so they're not busting down doors, spraying water everywhere willy nilly. You know, water is both the enemy and the good when it comes to the fire because wet collections, while very difficult to deal with, are better than crispy collections and burnt collections. But the better your relationship with the fire department is, the more the the better you'll rest assured that they're not going to do anything that they don't have to do in order to save your your museum and your building um and they the the fire rating of the building would be something that your builder would know um or the fire department might have some idea you're going to want to know what kind of fire protection system you have do you have smoke detectors do you have an alarm system 
um, again, these are questions for your building, your building folks, facilities folks. Do you have alarms on all the emergency exit doors? Do the doors unlock when a fire alarm is activated? Who checks all of these systems and how often are they checked? You know, how often are the, um, are the folks that put in your, your fire protection system coming in and testing it? We used to have, I think we had quarterly tests. Um, and then what kind of system activation are these? Are there sprinklers? Are they wet pipe or dry pipe? Who's gonna turn it off? These are all really important questions really for you to know in addition for your lender to have the answers to because you're going to want to know in an emergency who is responsible for all of these things and how to um, how to turn the system off once it's once the event is over you know how to make sure that it is reset in the proper way who do you talk to about that um, what kind of a system do you have? If it's sprinklers, there, we have, there are questions about the sprinklers. Is it a wet pipe or a dry pipe system? If you use gaseous fire suppression systems, let's talk about those. Um, and then there's questions about fire extinguishers. Do you train your staff on fire extinguishers? There's some really fun, easy ways to train on fire extinguishers for, for small events, which are really handy. Um, and knowing where the fire extinguishers are is also very important. Um, some institutions might ask you to provide um, floor plans of your museum and they're going to ask for potentially where are fire extinguishers, where are sprinkler heads, you know, they could ask a, couple, a number of different questions related to fire protection to make sure that the um, the possibility exists to make sure that the protection is there, you know, well, do you have fire extinguishers where you need them? How many, when are, how often are those tested? Because again, you can have lots of fire extinguishers, but if you don't test them, then um, they may not work when you need them to. And then information about your local fire station, how far is it? Um, when did they visit to plan? Um, if they haven't, is the institution willing to devise a plan with the fire department? So it's also, you know, sort of leading questions like, well, okay, you don't do that. Maybe would you think about doing it? We can talk about that. We can talk about why that would be a really good idea for your institution as well as for your, your borrowing profile. <laughs> All right. The next section here is security. Um, and this is where the, the facility report is definitely, again, like I said earlier, something that's very confidential, because this is going to ask really pointed questions about how many guards you have, how are they armed, um, who is responsible for them, who has keys to certain, who has access to different parts of your museum. Um, this is not information that you want just anybody to have. So you do want to be a bit judicious about to whom and when you you share the facility report. It's not something that should be on your website. <laughs> it's not something that should be given out on a regular basis to folks just because they're interested. Um, it's really something just for borrowing institutions and for you yourself to have. Mm, excuse me. So let's talk about security. Do you have a 24 hour human security guard? Do you only have electronic security? This is an interesting question to me, and I always feel like it's, it could go a lot of different ways. Um, at the Smithsonian, we have 24 hour human guards as well as electronic security on a lot of spaces. Um, when I was at the Textile Museum, we had guards during open periods and 24 hour electronic surveillance. And one time in the 20 years that I was there, we actually requested a loan from an organization and they asked if we had a 24 hour 
human guard? And we said, no, we have 24 hour electron, you know, either we have a guard during the open hours and then we have electronic security when we're closed to the public and when after it's after hours. And they asked if we would hire a guard um, because they required 24 hour human security for their objects. And that to us, to our mind would compromise the electronic security um, because we wouldn't be able to turn it on. And having one guard who didn't know our space, who didn't know our building, who would have to be there, we'd have to hire multiple guards because no one person can be a 24 hour guard. Um, so the cost of that and what we considered to be the risk involved in that made us decline, you know, we said, we don't want your loan after all, um, because we won't be able to meet these conditions. But that was only one time. Most, most folks, I think, can go either way on the type of security, as long as you have security. Um, but I, was, I remember being really surprised by that, that they wouldn't lend to us because we didn't have a 24 hour guard. But I think that was just one of the things that was very important to them. They felt that it was better to have a human on site than to rely on electronics. Um, but so we're, so then, you know, we're gonna go into all the specifics of what your security personnel are. Are they hired by your institution? Are they contractors? Are they both? Um, when we moved over to GW, we ended up with a lot of students as security guards. I know the Phillips Collection also here in DC uh, hires a lot of um, local students, young people to be their docents and security guards. Um, so, you know, it just depends on your institution and how you choose to staff those kinds of positions. Um, how are they trained? Are they armed? Do they have pagers or radios? Do you, do you conduct background checks? Does somebody else conduct background checks? Um, and then how many of them are there? And it's just, you know, are they sitting? Are they walking around through the building? In the galleries versus the regular building? Are those numbers different? Um, Who's checking on them? Who's checking on, on the guards? Who's, who's guarding the guards? It's an interesting question. But how often do the guards check the different galleries? Do they go once on their rounds? How long are their rounds? Are they multiple times on their rounds? So, you know, it's a question of the borrower being able to gauge how often is somebody looking at their object or the space around their object? Because, you know, things happen. So, the more people can lay eyes on things, particularly when you're closed, you know, even with the COVID situation that we have now, most museums have someone going into their galleries on a semi-regular basis just to lay eyes on everything and to make sure that um, it's not a miss. You know, just because there aren't people in the galleries doesn't mean that things can't happen. So we're gonna wanna know as a lender how often are something or somebody, whether it's a camera or a human being walking through, laying eyes on the objects? Um, and then what are your options in terms of movement, um, exit doors, internal doors? Is there extra security in your shipping and receiving area? Um, 515 here, indicate the positions and titles of the individuals authorized to sign for removal of objects from the building. Who's allowed to take stuff out? Um, you know, that's a really big question in a lot of institutions. Uh, it, at the Textile Museum, I was the registrar, but I was also the second, um, you know, right behind our facilities manager for um, who was gonna be contacted in case of an emergency. I had the keys and the pass cards to all the things. If anybody was gonna steal anything from that museum and get away with it, it would have been me because I was also doing the inventory. I didn't, but here at NMAI, I don't even have that kind of access. I can't even go into collection storage to look at anything, much less take it. Um, so there are different levels of security involved in all the different institutions around the country. So this is just 
an indicator of who does at your particular institution have that kind of power. It's always the registrar. Um, again, when I was at the textile museum, totally an aside story, but there was a, a colleague of mine who was a curator, had a friend who wrote novels and she came and interviewed um, a couple of us on staff. And we talked a little bit about some of the collections and how we access the collections, but we certainly weren't going to give her a lot of details about, well, so-and-so has this key to this other thing. Um, but, you know, we talked about access and we talked about who could access the collections. And about a year later, I get a copy in the mail of the book that she wrote all about this Japanese um, kimono museum, right where the textile museum was standing in DuPont Circle, which was really quite funny. And uh, this kimono has gone missing and it's a big mystery and how, who, who did it and what happened. And in the end, it turned out the registrar did it. And I was so offended. I was like, I would never take the kimono. <laughs> but, you know, the registrar really does in that, in her fake museum, had all of the, the security um, was pointing at them. You know, they had all the access. They had all the, all the people trusted them. It was just very sad. I was like, oh, giving registrars a bad name. Don't worry, registrars, we believe that you're honest. Um, other questions that they're going to ask, sorry, that was a very strange aside, I apologize. Um, keys to exterior doors. Does somebody check the bags of people who come in and out? Visitors, staff, both, neither? Do you restrict the size of the of bags that go in and out of your galleries? Can staff be in on off hours? Uh, paid volunteers, who has a badge? What does that badge give them? Does it give them access? Does it just give them a, a wave through the galleries? Like, oh yes, you can come through here. Uh, are people escorted? Does the institution have an emergency response plan? If you don't, you should look into making one. It's a very useful tool overall. Um, and this question is funny. It asks about an emergency response plan and then it, it asks about a disaster recovery plan. Those are not quite the same thing, but they have a lot of similar components and many institutions have one, but not necessarily another. Um, but you wanna know how an institution is going to both respond to an emergency and then what are the next steps? Like once you've responded and you've stopped the emergency from once it's happened, how are you going to pull out from that? So they are different um, and ideally you have both. What you may have is something that sort of does a little bit of one and a little bit of the other. So just have a, just think through like, what would your response be? And then how would that translate to the recovery afterward? Because what happens during an emergency is not always the same thing as how you could go in afterward and take care of what happens. Um, what emergency procedures are observed in case of theft or vandalism? Can you photograph, can, are photographs allowed in your galleries? This is one of those questions that I think dates back to probably the original um, standard facility report. And at the time, the question was probably, no, there is no photography allowed in the galleries. Um, but the advent of cell phones and social media and the importance of social media has really changed a lot of that. And so I know a lot more um, institutions have really taken out most of their photography restriction policies. So there is photography allowed with your cell phone as long as it's not a tripod or a flash. And a lot of museums say no selfie sticks, that kind of thing. Um, because that's more about the safety of the object rather than you know, being able to take a picture of the object. And there are some times when I've gone into museums and seen you know, no photography of this particular object. And that has to do with the um, different 
restrictions that a lender might place on um, the an image if there are copyright issues or not a light they don't have a license for a particular image that sort of thing so then we're going to ask about both physical and electronic systems um, electronic security physical security what are the is it motion sensors um, do you have a sound and alarm? Does it ring? Is it silent? These are all really interesting questions. And I'm apologizing now for the, the team stuff that's popping up. I closed my Teams app thinking that these things wouldn't pop up. So I apologize. Um, my staff are having a field day with somebody else's Zoom, but not mine. Um, so what else are the different uh, gallery security issues? Are there doors? Are there exterior openings? How often are the systems tested? You know, do you have somebody run out your um, emergency exit door and make sure the alarm sounds periodically? Sometimes that's how you test it. <laughs> oh, hey, somebody exited that door and nothing happened. I guess we should probably run through on a test of that. Um, and then if you have, you know, smaller objects, are there fragile or they're particularly fragile, or there are particular ways that you have um, in the past dealt with installing similar objects? Do you use vitrines? Do you lock your cases? Do you use security screws on your cases? Do you hang pictures with security screws attached? That kind of thing. So, and then some of these questions are, you know, can we get an alarm on our object if we really want it? That can be a question that you can contemplate. Um, sometimes alarms are more trouble than they're worth, I will tell you that. Um, but some people are particularly concerned with making sure that everything is alarmed. Um, and then the section on insurance is pretty basic. Do you have insurance and how is it insured and who insures it? And they, very specific, again, wants to know what the coverage is, who your underwriter is, who's covering it, um, and what the deductibles are. Have you claimed losses in the past? Um, and questions about self-insurance. So now the next section is loan history. And I think this is where I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and Melissa, we can go back to the PowerPoint. And by stopping sharing my screen, I think I can maybe see if people have questions um, so far. So yes, so going into the loan history, um, I was done with the document. I was like, oh, we need some more color here. So we went back to the PowerPoint. Um, so the loan history is going to help tell the borrower, you know, it's like a reference list. It's like when you apply for a job, well, where else have you worked before? Now, at least we're going to ask, well, where do you, have you borrowed from before? And what successes have you had? And if necessary, we can check up on you, which is an interesting concept, I would think. Um, I don't know that I've ever called as a bar as a lender. I don't know that I've ever called anybody on the list and said, "Hey, how did it work out when, you know, we when you borrowed when so and so borrowed from you before?" But you never know that that might happen. Um, and then next slide, please. There's a section called um, supplementary information. And this is where if you answer that you are in an earthquake zone, a zone with other natural catastrophes like hurricanes or tornadoes, high wind, um, or any kind of brush zone, there are gonna be supplementary questions. And you don't have to answer all of them if you're not in all of these different kinds of areas, if you're just in some of them. Um, but it adds another layer of what your preparation is going to be like if you are in one of these areas. If you are in an earthquake zone, for example, um, we have a very large loan with the um, 
Anchorage Museum in Alaska, and all of those objects were prepared with very special um, mounts specific to an earthquake zone. And lo and behold, um, there was an earthquake there, if you recall, in uh, 2018. Was it already 2018? Yes. Um, and all of those objects, while they got jostled around and there were some case issues with cases, the objects were fine because the earthquake mounts worked exactly how they were supposed to because we knew that they were in an earthquake zone, there was a good chance that there would be an earthquake and we wanted to make sure that the objects were as safe as possible. So by knowing those kind, that kind of information, the preparation for that loan, the lender can account for that and prepare them properly so that nothing gets damaged should one of these events, which it's weather, it happens, you know, um, natural catastrophe um, happen, you know, so that it can be mitigated. It's, it's a really good mitigation tool to know going in what the risks are. Um, your insurance company would certainly be able to tell you that as well. Um, and then other things that the facilities report is gonna ask you for, floor plans, where would the object be displayed, um, and then the questions about floor plans, things that you might want to highlight. Uh, are there vents in the display area? Um, are, the, are the doors between the display area and other parts of the building, are they fire doors? Um, like I said before, I think during the fire protection section, you know, where are your portable fire extinguishers? Um, where is the piping for your, um, your you know, uh, fire pipe system, uh, the the HVAC system. Um, what's your path? What are your pathways? Any kind of um, map of your facility should include the pathway from the exterior of the building to get the crates into the building. Where where are they going to go? Is it very you know? Is it very circumvent? Are you circumnavigating the building just to get into one space because the doors are in a different? Uh, dimensions based on the crates, that sort of thing. So, you know, it's just a question of laying it all out there and making sure that the lender feels comfortable with your space. You don't have to have a perfect space. We don't expect you to have a perfect space, but the more we know about your space and your limitations, then the better prepared we can be when preparing the loan objects to make sure that they are as safe as possible. And then, um, let's see, last slide, please. I think that's, finally, the last bit of the facilities report is this verification. It's like, I'm gonna sign off on this. And yes, the information that I've provided is what it is, and I vouch for it. Um, and once you've completed the facility report, once, you're not really going to have to do it again. You'll want to update environmental conditions if they change. You're going to update it if there's construction happening. But a lot of it you're not going to have to touch. So this is sort of the only part that you'll have to update every time you send it out to a different um, potential lender. Um, next slide, please. So that's it for me. That was a lot. Um, but I hope that it broke it down a little bit so that you could really just see what the individual parts are. So now I think I've left enough time if folks want, um, if folks have questions, if there is specific information that I've glossed over that you think I should focus more on. Um, and my contact information was at the, on that last slide and certainly um, Melissa has my contact information. So if anybody has questions that they'd rather ask me later so thank you so much that was a wonderful presentation what uh questions do we have for rachel i threw a lot at you so yes it was really very informative though and i will make sure to place um a link to the general facilities report on with along with the webinar on our website um so people can access that easily Is there any, any questions? You were so thorough.
<laughs> Either that or I put everyone to sleep. <laughs> no, no, no. You had wonderful antidotes. It was, it was perfect. So I, I learned a lot actually myself. Um, okay. Well, if we don't have any questions, then I guess we will just sign off and I will see you guys in a couple of weeks um, after Thanksgiving. Um, oh, wait, maybe Selena has a question. Did she just pop on? <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> I, just wanted, I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew I was actually here. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, good. good. <laughs> it was a good presentation. I really appreciated you going through each section. Um, so, and I did, I also appreciated your anecdotes. I think um, some of the things you provided kind of provided clarity and a little bit of reassurance too. So thank you. Yes, I, I agree. Good. So, um, okay. Well, if there's no other questions then, um, I hope everyone has a great rest of the week and stay safe and we will see each other soon. Thank you very much again, Rachel. Thanks, you're very welcome. Take care, everybody. Take care.